and welcome back to Otaku No Video as always. Thank you very much for joining me. <sighs> Have you ever watched a show or a movie where it just pushed these buttons where you recognize the technical expertise, you recognize why people might like it, but you really can't enjoy it. And you have to ask yourself, is this completely subjective? Is this just me? That's how I feel about Gundam Thunderbolt. I just watched episode one. This is a multi-episode OVA. I think it's going to be eight episodes. And so, first off, um, Gundam Thunderbolt is an OVA set in the Gundam Universal Century timeline. It's the main timeline that most Gundam works, well, at least half Gundam works, are set in. So there's a lot of history, a lot of backstory. And this is set within uh, the, you know, early in the timeline, and it deals with a lot of stuff. Um, it deals with, and what is perhaps remarkable is that it is arguably the first Gundam Universal Century story to show both sides of the conflict, the main conflict, equally. We certainly sympathized with both sides in early shows. We've had some shows that are primarily from the Xeon perspective and some primarily from the Earth Federation perspective, but with the possible exception of 0080, we've never seen a show which, which gives equal time to both sides. And... the characters on both sides are going through a lot of difficulty. This is a show with a lot of angst. It's, and it's a very dark show. Uh, one side is a set of snipers, and the other side is a unit of Federation forces that are moving through the area where the snipers are based, and so they're trying to basically clean out these snipers. And so you get to see the, what's going on within these different units. And here's the problem. Gundam Thunderbolt feels like a 14-year-old boy saw Gundam and thought, this isn't dark enough. You know, Gundam should be more dark. It should be, it really needs to be more edgelord than this. So everyone should be miserable and everybody should be, like, trying to screw everyone else over and everyone else, everyone should either hate everyone else or be pushed away from everyone that they really like. Um, and just that's that's real. That's serious. That's that that's dramatic. I certainly don't mind darkness in anime series. One of my favorite anime series of all time, Serial Experiments Lane. It's a pretty dark show, especially given what Lane does to herself at the end. Anyway. Um, this is just darkness piled upon darkness piled upon darkness. It is, um, pushed in your face so much it becomes absurd. And that's the problem, is that there's just so much attempts to be, again, kind of edgelord, that it goes over the top. Um, every time you meet a nice character... Any character who is not dark and brooding, they will either die or be tragically screwed over and end up dark and depressed at the end of, of the episode. With one exception, and it's pretty clear that's the direction they're heading with that character anyway. It's really, really frustrating. And again, I can't tell if this is just me. If I'm just reacting against this darkness, or if this darkness seems reasonable to other people, if it seems like a valid directorial choice... But, I don't know, it, it, it feels like, Brad Bird talks about this with animation, where he says there's this tendency among animators to try, if, you know, if you're an animator on a major motion picture, you're going to be assigned maybe three shots in that entire film, maybe a few more. Um, and so you're going to spend two years doing these shots in the film. And so you're going to be spending 
months with an individual shot, which means you want that shot to be awesome. You want that shot to be amazing. You want the audience to never forget your shot. And the problem is, if every animator does that on every single shot, the film will be exhausting. The film has to have quiet moments. It has to have moments where the audience can breathe. And so some shots have to take a back seat. What Gundam Thunderbolt does is so loads so much melodrama, so much um, tragedy into the story, at least in this episode, and again, it's, it's about an hour long, there's a lot of material here, that there's no room to breathe. It just seems ridiculous that everything bad is happening to these characters. Um, and obviously it's not every single possible thing that could, that could be bad, but it's just, it comes to the point where it feels like it's darkness for darkness' sake, where they've decided to be dark, so they're just going to be dark. I should point out, I've bought and I've read the first two volumes of the manga. This is a faithful adaptation of the manga. They leave a few things out for time, but um, in terms of tone, in terms of the characters, in terms of where the story goes, this is faithful. So I, I'm not, you know, faulting them for that. The problem is it just doesn't seem... It's not entertaining. You know, it, it's one note. It is just the same thing happening to everybody all the time. Now, <clears throat> let me take a break from that. The animation quality is certainly um, impressive. Um, this isn't. This doesn't have quite the budget of, say, uh, Gundam: The Origin, where clearly you know every background character um, has some movement going on. There, there's a lot of attention t paid to the animation, just as animation in in uh, Origin, that Thunderbolt just doesn't quite have the budget for. Uh, but there's a lot going on in Thunderbolt. There are a lot of characters. And that's another thing I want to really um, point out here. Thunderbolt has a pretty large cast. And you, again, you have sort of two sides that you're following. And it's always clear which character you're seeing. They do a great job of introducing characters, showing them to us, even side characters who become more important later. We see enough of them to remember who they are and what their role is. So even if you don't remember their names, when they show up again, you're like, oh, it's that guy. Um, very clear, very distinctive character designs as well. Uh, without getting into, you know, giant blue hair. Um, and so realistic character designs by anime standards while also being distinctive. So excellent job there. The voice acting, you know, no complaints. I listened to the Japanese um, audio. I don't think there's a, an English dub of this. Um, so, you know, no problems. Everyone fit and seemed fine. Um, there are a few moments where the voice acting goes a little over the top, but again, I think that's just the, what they're given. You know, everyone is dealing with tragedy all the time, so it just kind of feels like a soap opera at times. <sighs> um, the, I, I also want to point out, actually, the, the general direction and editing. There are some moments in this episode that were very affecting where I couldn't stop watching what was going on on the screen. Where they do things with imagery, with symbolism. Um, nothing too complicated, but, you know, more than is required. Where they connect what's happening with the character with that character's past. And I'm just, you know, good on them for doing that. There are a couple of those, you know, th throughout the show. However, they also decided... And I'm not sure how much to put the blame of, of this on the mangaka versus the anime staff, because this is, again, kind of how it was in the manga, but there's you have some leeway in how you visualize this. The um, end of this episode, I'm not going to get into spoilers, but it involves um, a matchup between two main mobile suits. And that happens to be two mecha designs that are among the most intricate of the hero suits of both sides. So the Xeon mobile suit is quite detailed, with lots of little bits and, bits and bobs to it. And the Federation mobile suit, while not as um, uh, complicated as that, there, there's, a, there's a lot of other things on top of it. So it's, you know, th there's a lot visually. Then they put that 
final climactic thing in space amongst a bunch, bunch of space debris where it's very dark. In other words, there, there's all sorts of stuff around them, so light just kind of can't penetrate very well. So they end up being basically grayscale, and they make the shot, they make the, the fight very chaotic, where it's often hard to tell what's going on. Now that is often an intentional thing to do in, for example, a war story, and this is fundamentally a war story, where you don't necessarily know what's going on. But here's where people get a little confused. There's a difference between my not, um, there's a difference between trying to get across what a character does or doesn't know and making the audience not know what's going on. In other words, you can get across the idea that as this character, as this pilot, I can't tell what's going on. That's useful. When you make that chaos something that then is translated to just what the audience is watching, where the audience can't tell who knows what, that's not helpful. And that's what happens here. And because these are complicated mecha designs in a more or less grayscale environment where there's lots going on, I couldn't tell a lot of the time what was going on. You know, why choose those mecha designs? And then why make it that dark? And then why make it that chaotic all at once? I understand all of those decisions individually, but doing them all at once ended up with a sequence where I just ended up you know, sitting back and saying, well, I guess they're fighting, you know, because I see things flashing and I see a laser blasts going back and forth. But who is it? I don't, I don't know what's happening. It's really weird. So that was really disappointing. Um, one of the things I like about Gundam is its clarity. It is generally so good at making you understand who the characters are, what they're doing and why they're doing it, and what their status is over the course of the series. One of the most amazing things about the original Mobile Suit Gundam is how much you know about the main characters by two-thirds of the way into that show. Not just their personalities, not just their interrelationships, but what's going on in the larger war? What's, what's happening in the bigger plot? All these are clear. And again, while Thunderbolt does a good job of, of showing your characters and showing their stakes, the fact that these, these action sequences just get so chaotic at the end, in your climax, again, you can be chaotic in sequences moving up forward where it doesn't really matter, but in that big climactic face-off, that's disappointing. Um, <sighs> so, this is the first Gundam I've ever seen where I do not plan on watching any more of it. I've watched other Gundams where I've watched some and I'm like, I'd watch more of this, it's fine, but I'm moving on to other things for now. Um, I'll come back to it eventually, maybe. But Thunderbolt, I don't want to watch any more of this. I don't want to watch these characters constantly struggling with constant suffering, um, which seems meaningless. And here's the thing, I understand. That's what war is often like. That is what war often feels like. Um, and I get that they're, they're trying to get that across. I'm not faulting them for that. I'm faulting them for the fact that that is the entire story. is just tragic things happening one after the other. It becomes melodrama. It becomes a soap opera. So, I, and again, I still can't figure out if this is just my personal reaction or not. This is one of the most beloved Gundam storylines. This The Thunderbolt manga is has long topped the list of one of the Gundams, one of the Gundam manga to animate. Like, everyone wants this animated. I just don't get it. I don't understand it. Um, I don't understand why I am mm, having such problems with this. But those are my thoughts on Gundam Thunderbolt. I hope this is useful. I hope this is helpful. Um, again, you may go in and watch this and enjoy it. I'm not saying you will hate Thunderbolt. I am saying that it has its flaws.